be hearing Dr. Darren Tapp, who is an independent mathematics instructor and operates what he calls Dr. Tapp's Mathematical Playground. Dr. Tapp. Thank you. All right, so I'm Dr. Tapp. Uh, I, a little bit of history about me. I, uh, I liked math as a kid. And um, I ended up in college and I studied physics because there's a lot of math and physics. And then I uh, kept going to college and uh, studied math for a master's and a doctorate. And uh, when I finished all that, I looked back and I said to myself, I'd been, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but I figured out I've been institutionalized, you know, in a public school or, or a little bit of private school, but I've been in an institution for 24 years. I've been institutionalized for 24 years, right? And that was a little bit uh, disheartening for me to think about that. Also, um, you know, except for the first six years, it was in a government school. It was in a public school or a public higher education institution. You know, so the government money was in there and then I was all ready to be a mathematician and uh, I, I learned that Matt, and in grad school, I became less and less fond of the government, let's say. And uh, I learned that mathematicians often apply for money from the government to do their research. And, the, you know, so the government has a lot of say in what research is done and what's not. And all. So, and so I, I kind of got a, developed a bad attitude after this, right? But, um, but there's something to be said. So something happened. What, uh, since then, I've, I've done a lot of teaching, teaching math, as you can imagine, and uh, something happened. I had a homeschool student in my class, uh, and it was an algebra class, and it was really interesting what would happen because I would explain some algebra or something, and she would say, I, I don't understand that. I'm like, okay, and, which is what you want students to do because, right, if they don't understand it, then there's no point in g going for it. So she asked her question and I explained it. And then what was different about this homeschooled student as opposed to a lot of the other students is after I explained it, you know, went into more detail about what she didn't understand, she goes, oh. And that was, that's all, she, like, oh. Like, and then I went on, oh, right? And, and um, you know, and then one time she asked a question that was a little bit more than I wanted to explain in, the, in front of everybody. So I invited her to my office and she came by. Spend maybe an hour, two hours, maybe, you know, just going through the basics of math, and because I can explain everything when you're when you're in my office, right? I don't have to worry about everybody else in the room. So, um, and then after that, she had fewer questions, and and but that got me thinking. Maybe it's not really uh, the the fact that the training, uh, you know, the the public most people go through public schools that get this mathematical training. Maybe it's not really that mathematical training that's uh, keeping so many people from learning math or, or actually having anxiety um, anxiety about math, maybe it's actually the public schools that are causing it. Because uh, I'm pretty sure with this homeschooling student, she just hadn't been exposed to the concept of algebra. And so if she comes with a clean slate, so to speak, it's just, oh, okay, I can learn algebra. Great, perfect, thanks. But um, it might be the case that public schools are actually making uh, learning algebra more difficult than it needs to be. That might be the case. I'm not, sh I don't know, I can't really prove that or anything like that. So, uh, so I, I got it in my head that let's see what happens if, um, if we, we try to do math instruction maybe right, okay? <laughs> Let's see what happens if we try, kind of from the ground up build some math and, and teach math um, and do it in a way where there shouldn't be an, any anxiety, okay? And so a result of that is what I'm calling Dr. Tass Mathematical Playgrounds. And uh, that right now that consists of me going to Portsmouth every Tuesday and having six through eight-year-olds come by. And uh, t I explain concepts of arithmetic to them. And I meet them for, that's an hour and a half, you know, every week. And we're having a lot of fun. That's why I'm calling it a playground, not a school or anything like that. Another reason, another thing, if, if I don't want to encourage any anxiety at all, we don't have any tests. We don't have any tests, there are no grades, there are, there's, there's nothing like that, okay? And, and I've found that the results are just fine because I'm, I'm, I have 
a, a six-year-old, seven-year-old is like, okay, let's do addition. And she'll go to the board instead of me at the board. She'll go to the board and, and uh, she'll have me write up some questions maybe and she'll do the addition. Pro and she just does them, right? And I don't need to have a grade. I don't need to have a stick or a carrot. Just like, oh, isn't this neat? Look at this. <laughs> and, um, and so we're progressing a little bit. I've only been doing this about, uh, well, I started in November, so that's eight months now. And almost nine, nine, ten, whatever. Um, and I mean, I can see the level progressing, uh, and I'm really excited about what this might mean uh, for a community like this, right? If we could make, like, we're in a community here. I moved here. I, I got tired of being institutionalized with the government schools, and I, I, they, I stayed around because they paid me. But, um, but, I. I, got, I moved to New Hampshire for all this more freedom, right? And, uh, and up one thing you'll notice when you get here is there is a community. There is a, a real, there's tight bond community. And it's, and it's, it's not quite a family, but it's kind of like a family. I mean, there are, like, you know, the weird uncle you don't want to talk to. And, but, you know, it's just, you know, that's what a community is, right? You've got all kinds of uh, people involved. And, well, what if, as a community, we can build... Our, our young people, or the, not our, but the, you, know, it, you know, people with children, they, what if they can have just really great analytical brains? Think about that. Think about what that would mean for our community, right? One thing, like, okay, so I'm, I, you're looking at an American-born math PhD, right? You know who employs more than half of the American-born math PhDs in this country? You, you know? It's the NSA. The National Security Agency employs more than 50% of American-born math PhDs. So I, I didn't go to the NSA because I didn't like the government. <laughs> so, uh, but imagine what if we, if we, if, if like kids that already have an idea of freedom, what if they really learn math, right? What if we get three Satoshi Nakamoto's in our community in, in the next 12 years? Wouldn't that be great? Right? We wouldn't even know who they were. <laughs> right? And so that's kind of what I'm envisioning. I'm envisioning that we can um, increase the analytic level of our, of our children. And, uh, and as they grow up, that'll bring rewards for our community. That's what's going to happen. Um, so this is a, a, a talk that's a bit about math. So I do, I do want to mention some of the instructional techniques that I'm using with the young people. So I mentioned some of the principles that, uh, that I kind of laid out. So one principle with, with seven-year-olds is basically trying to remove every level of abstraction that you can remove, okay? Now, in math, you can't remove every level of abstraction because as soon as you write the number two, you wrote a symbol that means two, Right? It doesn't mean what you wrote. It means something else that you have to figure out. Right? So there's some levels of abstraction you can't do without if you're teaching math. But I just try to remove every level of abstraction. So um, if you have a young person and you want to see what I'm doing, you can come by at, the, at the, what's they, the, what they call the bingo hall uh, at 3, and I'm going to do a demonstration. And uh, part of that, I believe, will be, I think they have the supplies for me. I have to go get them if they don't. Um, it will be building a polyhedron with, uh, with gumdrops and toothpicks. Okay, so, so basically with that, I, I try to teach about what are the, called the platonic solids. I like to teach this to young people because there's only five of them, right? <laughs> right? There's only five platonic solids, so I get to teach five. And then I try to have them build them. I say, hey, I invite them basically to build them. But uh, they often say, I want to build something else. And, and if it's a libertarian school, when a kid wants to build something else, what happens? <laughs> you let them was the comment at the front. So yes, exactly. Yeah, you can build something else. So like um, one time they built a cube, which is a platonic solid, but they kept going. And they built a cube on a cube and a cube. And they ended up with a nice three-dimensional lattice. Now... If I set out to say, I'm going to teach seven-year-olds about three-dimensional lattices, I would actually think I'm kind of crazy. But when, you, when, a, when seven, six and seven-year-olds build a three-dimensional lattice in front of your hand, eyes, you're going to mention, oh, that's a very nice three-dimensional lattice that you made. Okay, so now what this type of example shows is 
Well, with math, you can you don't have to. I, I try to. I do try to incorporate a lot of geometry. And one thing geometry allows me to do is it doesn't necessarily need to have a right or a wrong answer, right? So one, one of the platonic solids is called an octahedron. It has eight faces, octa, whatever, right? And um, so I had a young person hold up something and say, is this an octahedron? And well, an octahedron would have a square and like it's a pyramid on top and bottom, right? What, what was held up was a triangle with a kind of a pyramid on top and bottom, right? So I said, no, that's not an octahedron, but that's a very nice bipyramid over a triangle, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the only terms I have to explain what they built, but like, look, uh, an octahedron is a bipyramid over a square, and so I got to explain the difference, but I didn't say you're wrong. I said, that's very nice, right? Um, and I think that a lot of math stuff is that way. Now, there's certain things, like we, um, a big deal, when, with my playground, the geometric stuff we do, I don't consider an objective. You, like, I don't expect the kids to, you know, be perfect Fibonacci spiral drawers at the end of the day, um, although they're pretty good. <laughs> um, but uh, but my, the objectives of what I'm doing is with, on the arithmetic side. I want them to be able to add, multiply, div subtract, divide. Right, well, who doesn't want their kids to know these things, <laughs> right? Especially in today's society. Think about today's society. Think about the level of technology we have now and think about all the people it takes to run that technology, right? So the, so the amount of jobs for people who understand math and analytical things, I can testify to this, is going to be quite substantial. Uh, so I definitely think this. Another thing about ending math anxiety that I do, and, um, uh, but, to, uh, all, but this is more just incorporating a, a curriculum for the modern world, is I actually have a calculator there that I provide. It's a four function calculator, because uh, you know, I get questions about every button that's on there, so I have to keep that the number of questions down a little bit. But um, like we, I had to explain square roots because I had a question about it. But, um, but we don't, I don't really shun technology, right? And when you don't have tests, that's, not having tests allows you to introduce technology into the classroom and not worry, I mean, and you don't get all this uh, thing. But I've taught grad, no, I've taught uh, undergrad level, you know, basically a remedial al algebra course. It's called developmental algebra now, so people don't feel so bad. Um, so I've taught these courses where they're not allowed to use calculators, and you get all this pushback, you know, oh, well, so for the seven-year-olds, I'm like, yeah, let's, okay, here's the calculator, yeah, use it. And um, if we're ever trying to develop the skills with, without the calculator, I'm like, oh, let's not use it right now. And, but you don't get any pushback because there's no grade, right? <laughs> the undergrads are pushing, saying they want to use calculators because they, they're worried about their grade. If, if seven-year-olds like, okay, we're just not using the calculator right now. So, but, uh, and, and that's another thing about playground. The old, the kids will play with, I, I did this myself. Kids will just play with calculators. And they, I mean, right away, as soon as I introduced the calculator, six-year-olds, like, I just typed 642 times 473, and it says whatever it says. <laughs> I can't do it that quick. So, but they could, and they, then they say, what's this? And so I have to read off that number, and, you know, um, in all the, in as many syllables as the number takes to read off. And, um, I mean, the kids are really interested in really big numbers. And, uh, and there's a lot of interest they have. Um, somebody was asking me about word questions before, uh, before I came up on stage. And I, I have been wanting to kind of incorporate word questions. But the person that was asking me before this was basically they were critical of word questions in math class because they seem to be so artificial the way they are. And so I haven't really thought about, okay, what word problems am I going to do? Um, but what has happened is kids will come up with their own word problems, right? Like, like right bef before our playground starts, I, a six-year-old asked me, um, how many seconds are in a year? Right? Perfectly fine question. That's a word question, is it? How many seconds are? <laughs> so, okay, how many seconds? I, I had the kid, like, how many seconds are in a minute? How many minutes are in an hour? How many hours in a day? They got all that. They didn't know how many days in a year. But we, you know, I told them 365, and we multiplied, and that's how many seconds in a year. When we use a calculator, <laughs> that's how many seconds in a year, right? So we got the question answered. Um, so I think that that's really great when the word problems come from them. 
Um, uh, the other report, I wasn't there directly to observe this, but one thing we'll do, instead of handing them a multiplication table and telling them to memorize it, I hand them a blank multiplication table and say, let's fill this in. And it takes them a while. It, I mean, now they're, up, now they're getting quicker, about half an hour to fill in a multiplication table. But uh, one of the seven year, seven year, eight year old students comes, you know, their age change, they just change, you know. <laughs> so uh, she, she brought her multiplication table home. And so the report from the mother is when they had to double a recipe or triple a recipe, she went to, she's like, okay, I need to do four times seven or something. She like, went to her table and looked it up. Um, so, but, but because I had her do, I think that because I had her do it from scratch, it kind of set in what it is and what, how to use it. And that's a skill that needs to be taught too, not just here's how to multiply, but here's when you would want to multiply, <laughs> right? So, um, so I've been having a lot of uh, uh, joyous type things uh, happen that way. And, and, and it's really interesting, like teaching college where you have, maybe 20 people in a class, maybe 30, maybe 180. Uh, th there's kind of this emotional drain that that is. It just is, right? Because you're, there's grades and they're not always the best. And, you know, the, 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 a lot of students in college will have math anxiety, which that drains me too. And I'm trying to keep my energy level up and not let them see that I'm <laughs> it's getting to me a little bit. Um, but when I'm teaching the young people, it's, I'm actually might come in there with no energy. Like, I don't know about this. I'm going to drive all the way there again. But, um, but at the end of it, I'm like, this, you know, that was great. <laughs> and um, yeah, so, so that's what I'm doing about math anxiety. So uh, I think that if, we, if math is just presented a different way, I'm sure that not everybody's going to be just a wonderful math expert, but I think that we can change the world so that uh, people are more comfortable with mathematical ideas and um, enjoy them more than uh, what is currently being done at, at many of the primary institutions. Question. Could you, could you stand up to the microphone, please, Christine? Will you be offering this for adults anywhere in New Hampshire? Um, I don't have plans to offer this for adults uh, right now. I'm trying to develop, and it's not ready, it's, it, but um, I'm trying to develop a, uh, a curriculum for adolescents, more of an algebra, because right, that's one of the principles with the young people's no algebra. So, but I do want to do algebra at some point. Um, if enough adults were interested and they wanted to chip in a little bit, I might be willing to do this for adults, Christine. So is your plan to go from the very young children up in ages, or are you really specifically 18 and under? And then secondly, how can parents um, really institute letting math just be like breathing instead of this issue that freaks you out? Yeah, okay, well, that's one thing. I mean, I, I, I've been holding uh, the playground at 10 in the morning in the Praxium over in, in Portsmouth. And, um, and so it's 10 in the morning. I did that on purpose. Uh, so everybody that's coming is not in public schools. Of course, in the summer, I might get a public school, but I'm not going to stop them. But um, so, so this has been very interesting. So the parents, and they're committed homeschoolers that bring their children to learn arithmetic from me. Um, so you can imagine that they're getting reinforcement at home. Uh, so what, what some parents are doing is um, are like when they're cooking, they, they, that's a great time to go over fractions uh, and just when they're, and do, we'll do other projects. And that's one thing that appeals with what, to, the, to the parents of what I'm doing because we'll do projects where we do make the platonic solids and uh, like almost artsy type things because there are different types of people. There's analytical and artsy. Why can't you have artsy people be analytical, right? Or, or do artsy things which are analytical. Um, so that's one way parents can do this. Uh, uh, another uh, set of parents is actually basically doing more of a traditional, like here's some exercises, do them. Um, and and uh, it's great seeing that happen too. So um, I, I, I personally, I've just been like, do you want to? Do you want to do addition? 
And, and yeah, you might actually get a no on that. What you get yeses are, it's like, do you want to make? Do you want to make an octahedron? They'll say yes. <laughs> uh, do you want to make this, or do you want to draw a Fibonacci spiral? And, so, and then you get a chance to talk about Fibonacci speakers, or they make, they make do you want to make a Pascal's triangle? The Pascal's triangle, for some reason, the kids have liked that. And it's great, but I mean, if you can look it up. It's, it's, it's very simple. All you have to do is add to do it, and they just, they just do it on their own. It's great. Um, yeah, oh, another thing that I think that is and promotes them initiating learning math is do not just give them like an exercise sheet where, okay, you do the exercises, you're done. Give them something where there's always something else. Like, with the, like one thing they learned was the Fibonacci sequence. So, like, so they can always say, what's the next one? What's the next one? What's the next one? <laughs> and they can keep doing it, and they'll get tired, and they'll stop, but, but uh, I, that's what I'm trying to do more instead of just doing a, a exercises. Let's, let's do it. And I'm, so now I'm trying to do all kinds of sequences. Here's the sequences of the square numbers. Here's the triangular numbers. Here's the, you know, <laughs> and then you get to draw the pictures that, of the triangles that tell you what the triangular numbers are. And yeah, it's all fun stuff, right? Um, and, and I think it all boils down to being no grades, really. I, I think that's the thing. Um, I have them make Mobius strips. I mean, I just do these little things. I had to make clocks. Uh, that was when I was really ambitious. I was trying to teach modular arithmetic. The modular arithmetic didn't take, but they loved making clocks, you know. So, so it, it's, you've got to be able to try stuff. And if it doesn't go the way you want it to, don't, like, get upset. You know, just say, oh, that's a very nice clock. <laughs> Or, or um, yeah, always keep an encouraging attitude. Uh, that's one thing with me. My mom was always very encouraging. I don't know. I don't. Uh, to this day, I don't even know if she was telling the truth. Like I was doing well in math. I have no idea. She's like, oh, you've always done well in math. You know. I just kept hearing that growing up. And so I mean, I. So I, I think that you know, creating an encouraging environment is a is a big thing. And 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 uh, again, with these questions where it's they, it's not really wrong. It's just different. And you just point out how it's different. And I, I, I think that's, you know, I mean, it, once you, you get a kid thinking about bipyramids, then they can say, what's a bipyramid over a pentagon, right? <laughs> it exists. It'd be kind of hard to build with the come down to picks. But anyway, so uh, there you go. Is, is there, are there any other questions? Okay, very good. Mary, I'm from Dover, and um, my son is a year and a half old. Um, so at what age do you think it's appropriate to start kind of introducing these kinds of things at home? Um, we do plan on, you know, possibly homeschooling. Um, and I know you're talking about six to eight-year-olds, but, you know, when, when our kids are three and four and that age, like what kinds of methods are good for us as parents at home? Um, three and four, I would definitely do hands-on things, um, maybe work on counting. I... I mean, it depends on the particular child, but um, if you can get them to write things, and, and if you can't get them to write things, get them to draw things. I mean, I mean that's one thing. The, the, the kids will just start drawing things. So, and, that, and that's something I don't really try to discourage. I try to kind of steer it over to, okay, now we're going to write things. But, um, yeah, just get them used to drawing. Just putting something on paper and doing stuff. Um, like, I mean, I mean, a big, I mean, with a six-year-old, some of them are getting the numbers backwards. Um, if you could work on the orientation, like, of the, I don't know if you could start the letters that early, but you, you might try, I mean. Shapes, yeah, sure, shapes. Um, and, and counting, like one, one of the, one of the um, stations of the playground is I'll bring out these little cubic centimeter blocks and they hook together and they, you know, you can count them and you can do that. They'll make squares and say, okay, how many blocks do that, are in that square? With, the, uh, with three, it's, they're still working on the language. Um, I, I, I would just do, have them draw, basically. I mean, yeah, sure. Hi, my name is Fee, and uh, I've actually been teaching math for nine years. And I would say for those young kids, 
besides writing and drawing and playing with it, ask them as many questions as possible. Just ask them questions, ask them questions. When they're playing, ask them how many cubes did it take to build that? And yeah. keep asking it, make them think. And I, I think a lot, a lot of problems with our education is that we, we kind of just toss them out these problems without asking them why it works and how it works. And you keep on asking them, make them think. Math is a, for me, it's more of a, it's a thinking process. So it's, an, it's, it's an idea of how to think. You know, and if you if you let kids discover math, math is not math is is something that you discover on your own. You know, it's not something that we invented. We invented the language, but it's something that's discovered. So you let this kid discover and ask some questions. I think they'll develop just fine. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And and there's certain things that I don't think are easy to write down. Um, a six-year-old, I asked him what eight times eight was. You know, I wrote it on the board. What's eight times eight? And he didn't know. But I, I really try to impress the concept of multiplication into them. And um, I have no idea what the thought process is in the six-year-old brain was, but he asked me, what times eight is 48? Because he knew I wasn't going to give him the answer to eight times eight. So I said, well, six. Six times eight is 48. And he's like, so I need to add 16 more. Where did that come from? I don't know, but... but I mean, get back to what the actual concept is. Uh, like with playing with the cubes, if you make a square, then you've just demonstrated multiplication. Um, um, J Jess Edwards, uh, who, who you might see around here, I'm not sure if he came this year, uh, he, he did something with his daughter where he cut uh, blocks to be different lengths, and he might wrote, wrote the length of the block on the... On that, like this is half a foot, a third of a foot. And so she could, and then they had like a, a thing where you could put the blocks in and see how much space you took up. So his daughter could just sit there for forever and just put the blocks in and see, okay, if I put a third and a half and a, and a quarter, oh, it's over, over one, right? Um, and he thinks that was a great thing that I haven't personally done that, but uh, uh, he did that with his daughter and he's very pleased with the results. Uh, you know, so, uh, so that might be one thing. I mean, uh, the more you can do hands-on is the better, right? The, the better. I mean, as, at that age. I mean, I don't think you can tell them something abstract in a book and, you know, and, and have them understand it. It's just, okay, let's just get you thinking. Are there any other questions? Yep. I'm Bobby from Florida. Um, my daughter hates math. Hates it. Do you have any idea of how I can help her discover well, math? <laughs> what does she she like? That's like she, you know she knows so much. Like those answers that you gave with. Uh, yeah. So so I'll just give you an example. I, I had a I actually had an 11 year old come to the playground. Now that's uh, not the targeted age group, but. I was a sister of somebody else. And uh, yeah, she didn't like math, she hated it. But she loved to draw, okay? And so, you know, after a few times work, just uh, observing her, I said, okay, draw uh, a road with buildings or something like that. And she drew a road with buildings. And then I drew, then I went and took another sheet and I drew a road with buildings, but I did it like with perspective, you know, how you have the focal point and all that. So, um, so I, I showed her how to draw the same picture to perspective and she could see the difference. And, and so she really appreciated that. And, um, and one thing working with the parents, it's, it's kind of hard to explain what I'm doing, but the, the kind of, I'm just trying to find an avenue through what they do like. And uh, by doing perspective drawing, technically in the background is a subject called projective geometry. Uh, but, I mean, that's not taught in normal, any curriculum like that you'll come across unless you go to grad school. Um, but get her thinking in terms of projective geometry, then we can bring it down maybe to Euclidean geometry or something like that. Uh, so that's, that's what I've done with, with the ones that don't like math is try to find out what they do like and build on that. But like I, I found that the six-year-olds, they don't have a preconceived thing. So 
if you, if you just let them talk about what they want to talk about and then, you know, tell them interesting stuff about it, they, they, uh, they do. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm Facebook friends with one of the things and a six-year-old's like, Mom, we're tired of watching movies. Can we do science or something? <laughs> so um, I think if you get early enough and, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm hypothesizing that the public schools might not aid in liking math, but um, I think I think that'll work. But you know, find her, her, what she likes to do, and then try to steer that towards some type of math. And 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 it, I don't think it has to be the standard curriculum. Um, just start with something. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yep. Question. Okay. Um, sure. So earlier you mentioned maybe starting a program for high school um, age. Yeah, like math, and 14. Yeah, and I don't know about anybody else here, but I feel like that's where my math anxiety as a person kind of um, really set in was in high school with that more difficult stuff. And would you consider opening that up maybe to adults too? Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, it would depend on how the class dynamic went. Uh, I think uh, adults could definitely add to that type of dynamic. So I guess I would consider it, yeah. But I'd still probably advertise that it's targeted. It's targeted to this. I mean, I've always said it's targeted, so it's not like you can't come. It's just, um, and there is there is a problem like when when you get too far of of levels, it does get to be a bit much. Like right now, I've got, or a few weeks ago, I had a, a, one student I was teaching addition, and the other one were pretty much on multiplication. And I could handle that, but if it starts to get um, like uh, there's a brother that's more on the algebra level, and I, there's nothing I really can do that's gonna uh, be for both. But I could make a different class that would work for algebra. But <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I'm not sure how quick, how high we can get them, how early, but we'll see. Um, one thing I will say about the algebra is what I'm exploring is what's called the Moore method. Um, one way, this has been actually done in some colleges. They, they, the teacher will come in, write a question on the board, ask the students what they think about the question. Students won't say anything. Teacher will leave. Question still on the board. Right, next time, next class, same question. It maybe stays there a little bit longer, teacher leaves. Third time, they say something about the, they say something about the question and then now you've got that dialogue started and um, and um, I mean, that's not necessarily what I would do with, I wouldn't do like, okay, I'm gonna leave the first day, but, um, but then you get this dialogue started and you, and you try to say, well, how would you prove that? And how would you, you know, and so it's basically proof based from the get go. And um, so I'm, I'm really hoping I can get that started because one thing I think is that if, if, if we can, um, at least in our community and even on the broader community, if we can encourage mathematics, we implicitly encourage critical thinking. And one thing I love about encouraging critical thinking is I think it will bring you to a more freedom-oriented viewpoint, but maybe I'm wrong, and if you arrive to your conclusion with honest, true critical thinking, well, you've got a good chance of uh, coming up with a better solution even. Like, if you think I'm wrong and you have good reasons and you can explain what you're doing, I mean, so maybe I'm wrong, and with critical thinking we can figure out what's better. So, yes, a question? So, public school math is terrible. <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, I think it really helps get kids interested, especially those kids with anxiety, if you teach them the story of where the math began. Right. Like with pure math, and teach them the story of like Pythagoras and oh, Aristotle, yeah. and teach them the philosophers and how math began, and I think... Well, a lot of students don't want to do math because they're like, why am I doing this? Right. What's the point? You just that's, need to teach them the point. That's a good point. I, I don't do it enough. I, I have taught them about Plato, right? When we did Platonic yeah. Solids, we got Plato. Uh, we had a Zeno paradox thing, like, you know, Zeno's paradox? So we did uh, Zeno says, it's like Simon says, only you go oh, halfway God. and then halfway and halfway. They played Simon says, and then we, okay, Zeno says. And I don't know if they got the whole idea, but... Yeah, yeah it, might, I, it might be for older kids when you're teaching algebra, but I think it's really cool to, you know, make it real life. Yeah, yeah, but they, they had fun playing Simon Says, so that was good. Zeno Says. And Zeno's Paradox is actually a calculus concept, but 
They don't know that. <laughs> I mean, it's just they're walking. You just walk half the way, walk half the distance, walk half the distance, walk it. You know. So yeah, I've, I've definitely tried to do a little bit of philosophy, and and sometimes it's just natural. Okay, let's. That's a question about philosophy. Like, uh, I did one thing I called measurement playground, where we took meter sticks and stopwatches, and we dropped balls and measured how long it take to hit the ground and how far it was up up off the ground, whatever. So measuring things, and. Um, one thing, you know, I had a measure dropping a ball several times. So once that immediately starts bringing in statistics and other things, like how long did it actually take to fall? You measured several different times. You got different answers. Uh, so that, and there's philosophical concepts at the base of that. So uh, it's kind of like you dive into those things. And, and that's the thing, if you don't have grades, you don't have to worry if it's too high a level. Like, okay, we did it one day. You didn't get it. We'll do something else. But the addition and the multiplication of the you know, the, those things I'm always wanting to go to, to improve in their level. Okay, well, I'm Dr. Tapp. If you have a young one, uh, bring him to the bingo hall at 3 or even tomorrow at 1. Yeah, and I'll be around any pork fest. If you have any questions, let me know. <laughs> <laughs>